existentialism series and specifically the Dostoevsky series in existentialism um, that I had a lot of fun last week talking about Notes from the Underground. And in a certain sense, Notes from the Underground was a work that would be repeated for the remainder of Dostoevsky's career as a novelist. The following novels, um, the four great novels of Dostoevsky, which all followed in time after Notes from the Underground, including The Possessed, um, Brothers Karamazov, Crime and Punishment, The Idiot, all of which I will be talking about, um, were in some sense a repetition in a much broader and large scale context narrative of the same character and problems that you find in Notes from the Underground. The problem in Notes from the Underground of a character who is um, troubled by the revelations of modern Western rationalism rather than liberated by them. In fact, it creates more problems to be exposed to these Western traditions of rationalism and the problems it poses for um, the existence of the individual rather than being a liberation of them. And that's exactly what you find in The Possessed in the sense that Whereas it's a problem for one individual there, it's problematized in this novel for a whole society of thinkers who are exposed, much as historically Russia was, to the Western tradition of rationalism and therefore like radicalism and, and you know, new theories about how society should be configured that took centuries to develop in Western Europe, um, really just flooded into Russia all of a sudden within a short uh, period of time in the 19th century and the consequences of that abrupt exposure to those ideas and the way that that tradition of rationalism actually complicated and further problematized the issues of existence for the person rather than liberated them is something which is expressed particularly in the novel to possess through the theme of nihilism. Now, nihilism is a big theme in existentialism in general, in figures like Nietzsche, for example, noting that in the Antichrist, for example, the, um, excuse me there, uh, the consequence of realizing that values are groundless, values are not fixed absolutely either by like the order of their own being ontologically or by some external ultimate first mover, like in Thomas Aquinas, basically God fixes the values of everything else. So um, the absolute values of morality, the absolute essences of what things are that you can understand them through is really just fixed by God externally. In Nietzsche, you realize that those values are groundless and the options that that opens up for you are either to fall into the nihilism of, as a result of that, believing in nothing or to have the courage to make your own values, knowing full well that they are groundless, but making them anyway. That's why for Nietzsche, the only truth is aesthetic truth. Aesthetic truth is the truth of beauty in art, which of course is groundless compared to the absolute truth of theoretical knowledge, the kind of truth of like two plus two equals four, where the mathematical truth is a fixed truth in comparison with the truth of a great work of art like Don Quixote or um, one of the poems of John Keats, for example. But that's precisely the kind of truth which affirms the will, which you'll have to get in a system that is confronted with the existentialist problem of groundlessness of values. And this book is about, um, in many ways, the other option, nihilism. Now, if you look at the title, The Possessed, I remember um, about 10 years ago when I first got into Dostoevsky, seeing this book like at the public library in town and thinking to myself, oh, that's interesting. Dostoevsky wrote a whole book about demonic possession or something like that. And in a certain sense, he did. But the um, realization I had when I actually started reading it was that it's more about directly the theme of nihilism being that which is, you know, possessing these people. And not only um, given individuals in, in the novel as characters, but also Russia as a whole, um, which in a lot of ways, the end of the novel sheds light, light on. Now, this is a big novel. It's a um, good 700 page novel, but it actually is a real page turner, just like everything else Dostoevsky wrote. So you can read it pretty quickly. 
Um, and it's definitely well worth looking into, especially if you can get it on Kindle for fairly cheap. Um, I would highly recommend you to check this out. Now, there are some passages in the book which focus a lot on like political dialogue, etc., that might seem a bit more dense um, and difficult to weave through as you know, a 21st century reader, but certainly there's a lot of really fascinating action in the novel and the psychological depth of the characters is unparalleled. Um, it's often so that Dostoevsky wrote novels like The Possessed with enough characters to, uh, enough quality characters, I should say, um, to serve several novels for even some of the other greatest novelists of all time. But for Dostoevsky, he just built these um, magnificent tapestries of social life with very complicated characters in abundance in each novel. And certainly that's the case for The Possessed. But I wanted to skip ahead to the end of the book to show that um, the quote about the possession in relation to the story of the pigs in the New Testament in the Gospel of Luke, when one of the characters, I don't want to spoil the plot by talking about um, stuff at the end of the novel that maybe you haven't reached yet. And of course, you know, it's like in the Kite Runner where the the narrator from Afghanistan is in um, a movie rental store in California and he sees a guy with a, with a VHS tape he's interested in buying and says, oh, that's a great movie, here's how it ends. And he looks at him like he's spitting his drink because in America, you're not supposed to spoil the ending, of course, so I'm not going to do that. But let's just say a character in the book is um, very ill, and he's on his deathbed, and he's delusional, okay, because it's the end of his life. And in his delusion, where he does not yet realize it's the end of his life, he does not re yet realize that he's dying, he's simply expressing wishes um, that are coming to him. One of those demands that he um, requests, that he puts to the woman nursing him in his ill state of health is to read the story of the swine in the Gospel of Luke. And that story is, of course, the one for which Jesus um, casts the, swine, uh, the demons that had possessed the man into the pigs, and they run off the cliff and they all die. And then afterwards, Jesus found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind now, restored back to his right mind. And the people who saw this were afraid. And the character who in his delusion asks the woman nursing him to read the story in the Gospel of Luke of Jesus casting the swine, the 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 the, the demons out of um, the man who is possessed, to enter into the swine, where they don't just possess the pigs and do nothing; they actually lead them off the cliff to suicide and to their own destruction. Is something of a metaphor for the kind of possession that is occurring in this novel as well, the kind of possession which is not neutral, but rather, and it's also not leading to liberation or leading to the right mind, because we know from that story that he's only restored to his right mind after they're gone. It leads rather to destruction. It leads to suicide. It leads, ironically enough, to putting you out of your right mind, precisely in the path that for this novel was supposed to, on a super rationalist basis, put you into your right mind. And that is something which on the next page, if you have your own copy of this edition, page 654, he says, you see, that's exactly like our Russia, those devils that came out of the sick man and entered into the swine. They are all the sores, all the foul contagions, all the impurities, all the devils, great and small, that have multiplied in that great invalid, our beloved Russia, in the course of ages and ages. But a great idea and a great will will encompass it from on high, as with the lunatic possessed of those devils, the idea that nihilism is really what has possessed Russia as a whole and will lead it to a type of self-destruction rather than liberation precisely by negating the kind of values that before sustained existence as meaningful. There's a difference in existentialism, for example, in the work of Kierkegaard between objective and subjective discourse in the uh, concluding unscientific postscript 
Kierkegaard talks about how most of what we understand to be meaningful discourse or truth is what is really just the objective, which is the truth of a result. Okay, that might be the result of a mathematical system. Um, two plus two equals four. Uh, it doesn't really matter how you got there systematically through manipulations and procedures and operations. The result is four. And that's all you really care about communicating. And you can communicate that. Um, you pretty much can objectively communicate to other people the result of an operation. Um, but then there's subjective truth, which is not the result of an operation. It's rather the way. It's rather something like the process. And the strange thing is that even if you are, say, a mathematician who had to go through a process to arrive at the result, that's not what you communicate. And it's also not what the people care about. It is rather just the result that you're given. And our society has actually just amplified that even well beyond the dreams of Kierkegaard or Dostoevsky, where now all we really deal with is the communication and transmission of these objective results. So much of the processing these days is not even done being done by any one person. It's just being carried out by, you know, armies of machines, legions of these impersonal machines crunching these numbers and all of that transmitting all this data behind the scenes. But that process doesn't matter. It's merely the obtained result, which is then communicated impersonally. But for Kierkegaard, that might work for something like two plus two equals four, or maybe, um, finding an email um, that you're, you know, is stored on some impersonal server in some data center somewhere in the world that you're trying to access when you log it into your account. Um, we've gotten pretty good at that type of communication. But what about your life? Is a life, a way, a process, a path, something which your concern is for a result or is it rather for a way and therefore is subjective communication the only option, and if you fall into objectifying what is subjective, you run the risk of uh, failing to really live, right? But also of making the um, process of your own self-destruction basically inevitable. And that's something I think, which is really what is going on in the possessed. In the possessed, you have this explosion of rationalism and these ideas of how a revolution should be carried out to perfect society with all of its flaws. You know, Russia lagging behind Western Europe in the sense, I'll qualify, of still having a monarchy and um, having uh, very old Orthodox religious traditions and um, serfs, you know, let's not... Um, kid ourselves about some of these things which seem like they're stuck in the Middle Ages and Dostoevsky's time, which, you know, the ideas of Western Europe and rationalism suddenly invade the intellectual scene in Russia and seem to provide an answer at the level of results of systematic operations and objectivities, right, that would solve all the problems. The problem with that is as this novel demonstrates, what you get by objectifying the subjective and putting your faith in the ideal rather than in the freedom, right? Putting your um, faith in the objectivity of some system rather than in the need to take responsibility as an existing subject to act, which in fact, you'll just flat out lose if you surrender all of that, is actually self-destruction. It is a novel not about how guys are just enlightened with all these brilliant theories and then they make a utopia directly. Like so many, quite frankly, um, pseudo-revolutionaries today think is not that hard. You have this idea, especially among um, like 19, 20 year old college kids who study this stuff for the first time of, well, why don't we just implement this stuff and then we'll have a utopia tomorrow, right? Um, you know, we've been enlightened. The only reason we haven't done this probably is just because everybody else hasn't been exposed. We need to just educate them and then make the utopia happen tomorrow. The problem with that is that actually falling into maybe developing rigorous systematic theories. And the printing press is a huge symbol within the course of the entire novel. It ends up becoming a huge problem legally for the secret society of intellectuals who are really the main character of this novel is that group of intellectuals who are flirting, dabbling with these ideas and believing legitimately that they can 
enact a revolution in Russia on the basis of them. The printing press is a big thing, and the manifesto, which is printed, is sort of objectification of all of those ideals. Like, here's one book that tells you everything you need to know. The manifesto becomes a huge problem for them later on legal grounds. It leads to, I won't, you know, spoil the plot, but it leads to some of their own, you know, people within whom they're dealing with getting murdered for being traitors, for leaking it, right? Um, As you could well imagine, the manifesto is not just some, you know, document that contains all the truth you need to know. So if you read it, you'll be enlightened and you'll lead to utopia. It's rather the source, I think, of the destruction of the society itself. Um, Although, of course, the actions of those possessed by those great ideas acting as the medium to actually carry out the murders, the suicides. I'm not going to spoil the details, but this is a book about murders and suicides and things like that. Um, And it's actually a precursor for what happened in the 20th 20th century. Um, You know, as much as it is uh, important to distinguish between theory and practice, it's a fact that A lot of the implementation of the revolutionary ideals in Russia, of course, of all places, did lead to a lot of murders and suicides. Um, The transition to the communist revolution in Russia was not just an enlightenment where we had utopia the next day. It was something that the possessed prefigures by quoting the way that Zizek talks about Stalinism is like people who died under Stalinism, you know, uh, were excused as, well, we're just building inevitably towards the better society and you got to crack a few eggs to make an omelet so their deaths don't think too much of them and that's exactly the same rhetoric you find in this novel when talking about the people who had to be killed for the revolution to occur um so it really is a prophetic novel about what did happen in russia and other places in the 20th century um and the idea that nihilism leads to self-destruction rather than liberation is something which uh, is obviously literally the case for some, but which also is rejected by some within the novel who function as something of a mouthpiece for Dostoevsky himself. Dostoevsky's own biography was, of course, that um, he got involved with societies like this one in his younger years, and he was arrested and taken to Siberia, where he lived in extreme circumstances for for years before he was... um, allowed to return home and the experience of being in prison in Siberia for ideals is something which led Dostoevsky to become a Slavophile and uh, uh, a monarchist and a conservative Orthodox um, Russian Christian, right? And the idea that for Dostoevsky himself, the experience of finding that revolutionary ideals led to something of nearly his own self-destruction rather than liberation, which led him to take the unexpected path of becoming something of a conservative Slavophile, um, is something that you find in the character of Shatov, who's arguably the most interesting character in the book. Um, Certainly near the end of the book, not to spoil plot or anything like that, he becomes even more important. And my own personal favorite character within the book is Shatov, who gives the very famous quote, uh, which one of you mentioned when I live streamed about existentialism a few weeks ago, where he says, Shatov says, but didn't you tell me that if it were mathematically proved to you that the truth excludes Christ, you'd prefer to stick to Christ rather than the truth. And the famous quote that not only can you not arrive at the religious truth that you're committing your existence to through obtaining a result from a mathematical or formal system, but even if you found that you had to go against the certainty of some formal system to stake your existence on a commitment to um, the existential leap of faith of um, of another belief, then you would kind of have to suspend the rational in order to really stake your existence on something you'd found worthy to believe in, which is kind of the same in Kierkegaard and Dostoevsky, and certainly a big part of the novel The Possessed. Now, The Possessed is a novel with so many characters and so many events and so many passages well worth uh, reading in greater depth that I'll have to defer that sort of thing to another video. But right now, I just want to 
talk about on page 562, um, the uh, quote about not one of them escaped with more wisdom or real justification. It had always just been the unrestrained domination of phantoms and nothing more. The idea that what they were really dominated by in German action by was a set of phantoms, things that don't really exist, although, ironically enough, they were supposed to be objective rather than subjective knowledge, and in a certain sense, they were nothing real, and nothing worth staking one's existence on and ultimately losing it for. And this is the type of nihilism for which he became utterly incapable of deciding in that he was simply a lifeless body, a crude inert mass. He was being moved by some awful outside power, which basically had possessed him to act, ironically enough, negating his freedom by making him act rather than allowing him to act. Um, and it is in this um, type of negation of your freedom rather than realization of it that one finds, uh, I think, a certain microcosm for the problems of the book as a whole. And, of course, the uh, number of passages which I personally underlined uh, while I was reading it are so numerous that I've already gone over 20 minutes. I'm not going to read that many more in this video. I wanted to kind of just do a general overview of the problems of the book. But I will conclude by talking about the way that also the opening character of the book, Stepan, is a failed academic in middle age, who's living with Vavara, who is his patroness, who's also middle-aged and um, kind of susceptible to being convinced by shady but nice sounding theories is the way I would characterize both of them. Drifting through the existence that uh, in middle age, they've already used up most of it, one would argue probably, but therefore being susceptible to strange ideas, I think is an inescapable context for the novel as a whole, as the idea of the the failed academic um, for whom the ideas were obviously important for his academic career, which he's now lost, therefore being susceptible to ideas, once again, however dangerous, um, falling into almost an inauthentic response to the ex existential dilemma by looking for something objective, like the academic worldly once knew, um, rather than taking the subjective path of trying to make that reality for himself rather than be given it as an objectivity, which I think is interesting. Anyway, that's about all that I have to say right now about this novel. I look forward to talking about it more in the future.